Today's show is going to be awesome. We brought in a certified superstar to the show today. He's known as the Hip Hop Financial Planner, and his name is Rob Wilson, and he works with athletes, celebrities, and he's taking time out of his busy schedule to come on the show today to talk about how we, people that are not athletes or su- or superstar actors and whatnot, to learn how to build wealth, because I think a lot of people hear the word wealth and they think that that's not something attainable for the everyday average person. And that's why I'm very excited about today's show because he's worked, you know, like you said, with athletes and artists and entertainers yeah. that have a lot of money. And it just goes to show you, we may not have their money yet, not yet, but we can do some things with our money now to achieve financial freedom. So let's jump into it. Let's see what Rob's got to say. All right. Today, we have a special guest on the line. We are joined by none other than the hip hop financial advisor, Rob Wilson from RobWilson.tv. Hi, Rob. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Now, you are a man that many of us want to hear from because you deal with rich people. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You've got, you, you work with entertainers and athletes. But before we get into all that nitty gritty stuff, why don't you give us a little bit of background on yourself on the personal as well as the professional side? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that, you know, I'm in the financial business now, but my undergraduate degree is actually in engineering. So I'm um, originally from Pittsburgh. I grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, went to the University of Pittsburgh and studied industrial engineering. And then I, when I finished, I went to go work for Deloitte Consulting, which is one of the largest professional services firms in the world. And I did IT stuff. So I worked for big banks and, and governments uh, doing information technology consulting. But while I was there, I sort of saw two different people who were successful at the firm. There were, there were the folks that were good at the technology side, and then there were folks that were good at going out, getting business and bringing in new new customers into the firm. And, and I decided I did not want to be the techie guy forever. And so I decided to go back to school. I went and pursued my MBA at Carnegie Mellon with the, with the idea that I would go back to Deloitte. But while I was there, my interest changed a little bit and I decided to get a little bit on, more entrepreneurial. And, you know, while the next, you know, the next Google or next Facebook didn't idea didn't exactly come to me. But short of that, I thought getting into the financial industry was a good best of both worlds for me because I could still be analytical. I could deal with numbers. I could analyze. I could do all of those sorts of things, but I could be out. I could deal with people. I could build relationships, bring in new business. And so I think it it, it worked with all the things that I felt like I was good at. And so I, after business school, I took a job at Smith Barney. I started to build my practice there. I uh, joined up with a gentleman at the firm that I met. When I first started working with professional athletes on my own, it just so happened that there was somebody in my office that was doing this business in a big way. And I mean, God works in mysterious ways. And so we decided to partner up. We worked together for a few years at the firm. We decided to leave and start our own firm in January of 2009, right? Right in the smack dab in the middle of the financial crisis, we left and start our own firm. And so we worked together for five years. And then this January, I, I decided to go completely independent and I launched my own firm, which is now called Wilson Insight. And so um, that's sort of the, the Cliff Notes version of you know how I got to where I am today. You've been able to work with some big name individuals, entertainers like Ryan Leslie mm-hmm. and Tyga, and you've even worked with some NFL stars like Hakeem Nix. Yes. And being around people, high income earners, like that, can you kind of break down what's the difference between being rich and being wealthy? Wow. So it, I don't know if you guys are, are fans of uh, Chris Rock at all, but he says the difference between rich and being wealthy, if you take a look at somebody like Shaq, uh, and right now, since Shaq is retired, you might want to think about LeBron James or something like that. Well, LeBron James is rich, but the guy who signs his check is wealthy. Right. And so like that. there are different magnitudes uh, of this when, when you really start talking about wealth. And so while while athletes and entertainers, they, they are really mass affluent and, and they're rich, there there is a different level of, you know, building true wealth. And, you know, when I go out and talk to people trying to get their mindset right around what wealth is and, and, and what being rich is, I, I point to these commercials that you might see on TV now where they're talking about retirement and, you know, they're kind of saying, what's, what's your number? How much money do you need to retire? And I Every time I see those commercials, I want to throw a brick through my television because wealthy people don't think about how can I save enough money so I have just enough till the last day until I'm gone. No, they think about 
what is the legacy that I'm going to leave? What am I going to leave to my children and my children's children? See, wealthy people, it's not about them. It's about generations that they won't even know. That's the really big difference in my mind. It's not planning for yourself. It's not thinking about retirement. It's thinking about how can we really build generational wealth to leave the people who come after you in a much better position than you were. Rob, there are a lot of people that feel like in order to be wealthy or even have a lot of money, you have to be in the right industry, such as being an athlete or an entertainer. But is that true? Is it really attainable for someone with just an average or even a below average income? So there's really two parts to that question. First of all, do you have to be an athlete or entertainer to be wealthy? Absolutely not. We have all, I guarantee you, been in line behind somebody at McDonald's that has $5 million in the bank and you'd absolutely never know it. No doubt. You would never know it. Now, your second part of the question was, was can you, can you really build wealth if you have an average income? And that's the difficult part because if you're making, you know, if you're out here making $25,000 a year, I, I can't say that it's going to be easy for you to build wealth. Now, is it impossible? No. You you live frugally, you save your money, you invest it, you know, over 40, 50 years, you'll, you'll be able to, to build something up. Now, I think what you're asking is, can somebody sort of live the type of life that they want to live while they can still enjoy it and still have this below average income? And that's going to be extremely difficult. But what I what, what I think sets me apart or what I, the way I'm trying to differentiate myself is I'm absolutely the make more money guy. I I can't, the worst financial advice I've ever heard in my life is for you to live within your means. Because who who is somebody to tell you what your means are? Because when you when you accept that as financial advice, I think you're inherently saying, I can't do any better. Mm-hmm. So okay. let me stop going to Starbucks as much or let me stop going out to eat because I, I simply can't do any better. So I, I need to live within my means. And I just can't accept that. I can't I can't suggest that someone do that because I think in this country, and, and I've been fortunate enough to travel around the world, and it is not we do, you do not have the same opportunity to build wealth in other countries. In this country, I believe that if you focus on living up to your potential, you'll never have to worry about living within your means. And so I truly believe that most people have an income problem. They don't have a spending problem. Now, that's not to say that I haven't dealt with athletes, right, who come into a lot of money and they don't know how to control their spending. Yes, I I get that. Those people certainly need to figure out how to control their spending. But for the the not 1% of, of the people in this country, I think they have more of an income problem. And I would much rather people focus on how they can make more money than how they can really scrimp and cut back because there isn't enough. You can only cut back so much. You can't get blood from a stone. I'd I'd rather you just increase your income. So for those of us that are in the 99 percent, what are what are some suggestions? You know, how do you go about getting income up for somebody who like myself? I'm just a teacher. You know, I'm just a high school teacher. It's not like I'm pulling down a high income of any sort. So for the average American family out there or the average American individual income earner, what are some ways that you teach people or mentality that we should have to do what you you suggest as far as getting our income up? So so the first thing is you got to say you got you got to not say things like I'm just a a, a teacher, right? I'm just a school teacher because you are a doing something amazing. However, the, the particular model that you might be operating in at the current time might not be correctly rewarding you for the value that you're adding. But, uh, you know, there's a story that I came across on CNN where there is a teacher in the Georgia area who started selling her lesson plans online and she makes a million dollars a year now. And and, and and it's something as simple as that because look, I, you're a teacher. I'm sure you realize there, there are times where you don't have time to, to get your lesson plan together. Maybe you want to imp- implement something new. She said, there, there's well, there's a whole website platform now where teachers can do this, but she said, look, I'll put these lesson plans out there and see who wants it. And she made a million dollars. So it's all about kind of doing some self-reflection, trying to find some talent within yourself or some market 
or some marketable product in your sphere that you can kind of use to kind of bring in some residual income? 100%. And there are so many avenues available to us now to get your art out there, get your work, get your expertise out there. It is just unbelievable. And and, and I think to some degree, people are a little bit asleep at the wheel right now because they don't realize the, the power. Listen, we're on this podcast right now and you're going to put this up and it's going to be instantly available to anyone with a mobile phone anywhere on this planet. Right. And if that doesn't if that doesn't blow people's mind, I I don't I really don't know what else they they want to happen, you know, for them to really be able to build wealth. When I was a little kid, I went to my mom and it's this is hilarious because I was a little bit pudgy, right? You know, it took it took me a while to get my get my baby. We only laugh because you laugh. But so so I went to my mom and I said, "Hey, I'd I'd like to have a a, a um a exercise show for kids. I think there should be an exercise show for kids." So she said, "Hey, if you want to do that, I'll help you do that." So we we wrote a letter to the um, PBS station in our town, and and he was said, "Hey, we want to do this," and they polite me politely wrote me a letter back and said, thanks, but no thanks, <laughs> right? They weren't in the market for that for that at the time. But if I was that same little kid right now, and I went to my mom and I said, hey, mom, I think there should be an interview show for kids. I'd have to do nothing else but to get my HD video camera on my phone out of my pocket, shoot a video for 10 or 15 minutes, upload it to YouTube, and it's instantly available to anybody in the world with an internet connection. That's that's unbelievable to me. If you would have told people that you could do, if you would have said 10 years ago that this is what you'll be able to do, people would have sent you to the insane asylum. And there, there there's so many opportunities out there that I think people aren't taking advantage of to really better their financial situation. I, I, I really hope we get them jump started today. You kind of helped me out with my mentality, right? I'm not just a teacher, right? No, <laughs> so I think that uh, mm-hmm. mindsets are probably huge in this whole endeavor in trying to become wealthy. So in your experience with being around rich people, wealthy people, have you noticed that there is a certain type of mentality that you need to have in order to kind of achieve wealth? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. Because some people have this weird relationship with money and they feel like, oh, you know, I, I want enough to be comfortable. But then if I make too much, like that's not cool. I don't want to be greedy, this whole thing. And that's, I'm not sure where that came from exactly, but r- wealthy people don't have this weird relationship with money because they believe, uh, and, and I believe now what I teach now is that I think that your goal Actually, let me frame it like this. When I go out and speak to people, I say that outside of your faith, I believe that money is the second most important thing in your life. And it's only second to oxygen. And the only reason it's second to oxygen is because no one's figured out how to charge you for that yet. <laughs> the moment they figure out how to charge you for it, money will be the, the number one most important thing in your life. And so we've got a weird, we don't like to admit that, right? We feel like we're, we're, we're greedy. It's evil if, if we admit that to ourselves. But listen, you can't, you can't take care of yourself. You can't, t- you can't take care of your family if you don't have the financial resources to do that. And so I believe that your number one goal, which you should be being taught in school, is how to become financially independent. It's not to go get a job. It's not to go learn how to sing so you can be on TV or do any of these other things. Your job, your number one job goal is to become financially independent. Now, your education and your job and your career, your business and all of those sorts of things, those are the tools and the, and the vessels and the vehicles to help you get there. But I believe that your your number one goal is to figure out how to become financially independent uh, because n- not that not and I'm not suggesting that money is going to make you happy. I'm not suggesting that in any way, shape or form. But what I am saying, though, is that when your finances are together and you become financially independent, it's going to take a lot of the unnecessary stress out of your life. From your experience, do you find that wealthy people feel that there is good debt or bad debt, or do wealthy people avoid debt altogether and just figure it out how to cash flow? No, wealthy people believe that there's good debt. No, without a doubt. I mean, you take a look at any company in America and they all have debt on their balance sheet. Apple has something like, it might be more now, but something like $100 billion with a B in cash in the bank and they still have debt. So there's there's absolutely good debt and bad debt. And so- we can talk about you know credit cards and, and those sorts of things. 
bad debt because it's not really helping you build an asset. We could probably do an entire show on student loans because that is yeah. really crippling people's ability to. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's horrible. Li- it's horrible. The the stories that we're hearing centered around being stuck in student loan debt. It's bad. It's bad. And you know what? The reason it's that way is because and, and this is, we probably were heard the same message when we were growing up. So go to school and do your homework and get good grades so you can go to a good college so you can get to a good job. And then it'll everything will just work out. And it unfortunately the way the world has changed, it doesn't work that way anymore. And so people people have been programmed to believe that the goal in and of itself was just to get a degree. And so once you get a degree, there will be a pot of gold waiting for you on the other side. And it just doesn't work that way. And and honestly the colleges should be ashamed of themselves for taking advantage of these kids and letting them take out forty, fifty, sixty, a hundred thousand dollars in student loans for majors that they know full well they'll never be able to pay those back <laughs> in any meaningful way. But get, given the major um, that they select. So, but but back to your question, there's absolutely good debt when you take out a business a, a loan from the SBA to go start your business. That is good debt because you are building an asset, something that's going to generate revenue to allow you to pay the loan back. If when you when you take out debt equity line on your house to fix your kitchen, uh, that's that's not necessarily the, the the best use of funds. So certainly wealthy people use other people's money to help them build their own wealth. Okay. Now, do you find any common threads or habits that wealthy people have incorporated into their lives in order to help them to get to where they are? One of the things that I've seen is that wealthy people, successful people, successful people are extremely intentional about what it is that they want to accomplish. And so when I sit down and I coach people, I work with folks, I, I, I will first ask them, you know, what is it that you want to achieve? What do you want to be? How much money do you want to make? I'll ask them a question to see what they say. And then I will ask them to show me their bank account and their calendar. And I'll tell them if they really, really want to do what they, what they said, because where you spend your time and where you spend your financial resources absolutely will determine what you're able to achieve in life. And so folks who are wealthy, who are successful, they are very intentional. They are unapologetic about what they want to accomplish. And they set aside time and they put on their calendar time to do the things that they need to do. So we will all put everyone else's appointments on our calendar. So when we have to meet with our boss, that goes on our calendar. When we have to go, the Comcast person is coming to your house that that's going to go on your calendar. But we will not set aside time on our calendar to work out. We won't set aside time on our calendar to uh, review our finances every week. We won't set aside time on our calendar to work on our business. And so what I've seen is that intention is very, very powerful. And when you, when you spend your resources and you set aside the time, you would be amazed at how quickly things can happen for you. Rob, there are people that are listening and say, you know what, I love what I'm hearing right now. Where do I begin to start on this road to becoming wealthy? Where do they start? The very first thing you have to do is you gotta ask yourself how much money you wanna make. What do you wanna make? You know, I sit down and ask people, and, and listen, I, I push people because I, I believe they deserve it and, and I believe that, you know, they have the ability to, to do great things. And so I was coaching somebody today, I said, how much you wanna make? And she goes, well, I, I think I'd be comfortable with you know making fifty five thousand, which is which is fine, right? But my question is, first of all, why are we trying to just be comfortable? Because I tell you what, comfortable can get uncomfortable very very fast. It only takes one call, one message from your boss, one illness, one accident. Comfortable gets uncomfortable very very fast. So so if you if you want to make fifty five thousand you think you'd be comfortable why not a hundred thousand why not a hundred and fifty thousand why not five hundred thousand what what do you feel like is the inhibitor that's going to stop you from doing that what is different about somebody else who earns that kind of money than you and so I encourage people to accept and realize if, if there were no boundaries, what is the number that you would want to make? Start right there and do not apologize to anybody about it. And then just reverse engineer it from there. So if you said, uh, so I'll put it this way. If somebody wanted to make $100,000 in this country, which would put you in the top 20% of all wage earners in the United States, okay? If you want to make $100,000 in this country, that's nothing more than getting 1,000 people to pay you $100. That's that's really it. I wish it was more complicated than that, but it, but it's not. And so somebody might say, Rob, well, 1,000 people, that's a lot. I don't know 1,000 people. I say, then let's reverse it. It's 100 people paying you $1,000 a year. 
And then they go, okay, 100 people, that's okay, but Rob, what am I going to sell for $1,000? And I go, okay, well, hold on. $1,000 a year is roughly $80 a month, and $80 a month is $20 a week. So quite literally, if you want to be in the top 20% of all wage earners in this country, you are no further than figuring out what product, service that you could put together to get 100 people to pay you $20 a week. And when you talk about the, the the number of people that you're connected to now through Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, uh, folks that you have on your email list, 100 people at $20 a week is not out of the realm uh, of sources for, for, for many people. So what might that be? It might be going out and cutting grass. It might be going out and shoveling slow snow. You might be delivering coffee to an office building. You might be creating lesson plans for other teachers. But but I just say that to say it is it is not rocket science. It is just math. You reverse engineer it, and then you figure out what value you can add into the world at that price. Man, that's awesome because I think that a lot of people can say, man, I need to come up with this big idea, this big ticket um, idea in order to attain wealth. But you I mean, you just said it plain as day. Get get a lawnmower, get a shovel, you know, deliver some some coffee, deliver some pizzas. I mean, just little little chunks yeah. could could get you. There. there are people out here uh, who are very, very successful in very, very non sexy <laughs> businesses. And it, it doesn't have to be sexy. They don't have to make a movie about your idea. You just have to get something that adds value that somebody's willing to pay for. And that's and that's really it. Now, we're we're from Chicago. Mm-hmm. And uh, not too long ago, you wrote an article featuring the greatest of all time. I did. <laughs> and you called it, are you playing the wrong game? Yeah. What do you mean by that? So, <laughs> so I used a picture of Michael Jordan and to to really bring back thoughts of when he decided to retire from basketball and was playing uh, baseball for a year. And it's and it was, you know, I think he realized, you know what, this is not where I'm supposed to be. This is not where my best use is. This is not where my calling is. And so I'm going to go back and do what I do and go win three more rings and three more MVPs and cement my place in history as the, as the greatest basketball player of all time. And so he figured out during that time he was play, playing baseball, he was playing the wrong game. Now, the analogy is in your life and in, in things that you say that you want to achieve, are you playing the right game that's going to allow you to achieve that? Because here's the thing. You can't hit a home run on the basketball court. Right. OK, you can't hit a three pointer on a football field. And so conversely, if you say, I want to be a multimillionaire one day. But if you're not putting the things in place, if if you're not even the realm or or in a model that's going to pay you enough to do that or you have a business, then you're just you're wasting your time because it's not going to help you get there. If you say you want to be a billionaire, right? But you're not running a hedge fund or you haven't started a business or something like that, it it's going to be very difficult for you to do that. And so the things that you say you want to achieve have to be congruent with the things that you're you're placing in your life, right? And so, you know, conversely, just if, if we stay on in this area, if if being a school teacher isn't paying folks what they feel like they they want to make and, and where that where they want to get in life, then you say, well, how can I take my expertise, right? And how can I match that up with with what I want? What what different game do I need to play? What different model do I need to engage in that's going to help me reap those financial rewards? So I, th- I just want people to think about what they're doing in their life and if it's really, really congruent with where they want to where they want to be in the future. Now, there may be someone, you know, that's listening and they still have a little doubt and they don't they don't feel like this is realistic to them. Mm-hmm. What type of words of encouragement would you give to them or what would you say to them? To convince them otherwise, I collect stories too of folks who you know really came from nothing, and that's what I want to hear, <laughs> and uh, have been successful. So, if folks in the audience are familiar with Paul Mitchell hair products, or Looking at a car, right? <laughs> so if you're oh, fa- if you're familiar with that, there is a gentleman who founded that company, and his name is John Paul DeJuria. And John Paul DeJuria, when he founded this company, he was homeless. He was living out of his car. And he had $350 in his pocket. And so 
he built Paul Mitchell Systems into a, a billion dollar company and then decided to start another business and he and he founded Patron Tequila. So he also mm. owns that brand. And so I would say folks that have right now a roof over their head and more than an access to more than $350 are in a much better situation now than he was before he became a billionaire. And so again, I, I would just say that in this country it's 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 possible. I'm not suggesting that it's gonna be easy or that it's a cakewalk or that it's something that you can just do in your sleep. But um, there, there are folks out there, whoever's out there in your audience, I guarantee you that there are people that they are smarter than, they are more accomplished than, they have more experience than a lot of other people out in the world who are have been very successful and who are making a lot of money. And so it really just, you change your mindset a little bit and you change your business model it's possible. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, you really do have to put the work in, but it is it, in this country. It's available to you. Ty and I, the mission that we have here is it's kind of simple. We want to empower as many people as we possibly can to get a handle on their personal finances. And we feel that if we can get a lot of people to get control of how they handle their money, that the ramifications go beyond just their household. You touched on it earlier in the interview, how wealthy people don't think about themselves. They think about their children and their children's children. What type of impact can we have on our community if we really grabbed a hold of the concept of building generational wealth? It's unfortunate and we may not agree with it, but with financial resources come influence, come power, comes recognition, comes prestige. And so, listen, again, we're, if we're going to go back and talk about playing this, the right game, if you want to have power and influence in this country, then that's the game that you have to play. And so if you're looking in community and you don't feel like things are going the way that you feel like they are, that may be because the community hasn't galvanized together. They don't have the resources. They're not able to contribute to political campaigns. They're not able to have uh, influence in the media because they're, they don't own uh, stations. They don't have editors at these at these major places. And so it, a lot of the things when when you feel like your voice isn't being heard, honestly, I feel like if, if the financial resources were there, uh, you could help people get in the right positions so that your voices could be heard. You could have somebody who's the editor at the, at the big newspaper. You could have someone who is a, a mayor of your city who is going to uh, believe in, in, in what you believe in or your representatives or, or your senator. You will have CEOs who are running major corporations who have a major impact on your city. And so, you know, again, while it may not be comfortable for us to admit that, if we get our financial house in order and we band together and we put those resources in the right place, we'll start to see a lot of the change in the community that we're we're tired of waiting for other people to implement. Now, are there any upcoming projects that you are working on that you would like everyone to know about? Yes, yes. I, I decided just here recently to embark on a, a on a big project. And so we talked about this a little bit before, but I have decided that I'm no longer going to talk to any clients or anybody that I coach about retirement. I'm retiring the word retirement. <laughs> um, because no one even wants to think about retirement. Okay. Who wants to think about when they're, you know, 62 years old and they're about to collect social security and they're sitting on the porch and in a rocking chair and they're not sure what to do with the rest of the day. No one wants to think about it, let alone take time to plan for it. So I decided, you know what, I'm just not going to talk about it anymore. But what I will talk about is financial independence, because certainly by the time you're 65, you hope that you're financial, financially independent and you've built up enough resources that you can live the type of life that you want to live. But you could be financially independent next year or in the next five years if you really wanted to and you put the right steps in place. And so to that end, I've decided to launch a project next year called the Financial Independence Summit. It's an online event where I'm going to bring together 24 massively successful CEOs, authors, uh, business coaches, folks who have been there and done that and they understand the path to financial independence. And they, they will come and teach one hour master classes in some specific area about how to become financially independent. And it's going to be a totally free event for people to register for. 
Uh, it'll go over two weeks, and I think it's just going to be awesome. And I hope we really start a different conversation in this country. Uh, we change the view a little bit of, of what our goal should be in, in get, gathering education and building businesses. So I'm, I'm right now I'm, I'm lining up all of my featured educators. We're going to launch this early next year. And But even right now, people can go to financialindependencesummit.com, enter their email address, and they'll get all of the updates and they'll make sure that they won't miss a thing. But uh, that, that's going to be a pretty big undertaking for me and, and I'm really excited about it. And we'll definitely make sure that we include that link in the show notes. Yeah, and after everybody goes and signs up and submits their email, if they want to stay connected with you in the meantime, how would they do so? Oh, yeah, great. You know, I would love to connect with with folks in your audience with any way that I can help. The home base for me is my website, robwilson.tv. But I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. My handle is at Rob Wilson TV and also on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Rob Wilson TV. So any of those outlets, please, you know, everybody in the audience, feel free to reach out. I've got a ton of free content up there, videos, uh, for my TV appearances and everything. And so a lot of useful resources, uh, but just reach out and connect and ask me some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, hip hop's financial advisor, Rob Wilson has hooked us up with some major, major advice today. Thanks for coming on the show, Rob. Hey guys, I, I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's truly an honor to get asked to, to come and talk about your expertise and what you guys are doing is highly necessary. And I'm so happy that you're doing it and just glad to be a part of it. Wow, that was cool. I loved how he said that, you know, he doesn't like it when people say live within your means. Like, what does that mean? It's like putting a ceiling on you. you That's know what I'm saying? saying. We've been saying that for years. Live within your means. Live within live your means. Live below your means. That's right. What, that's what we say. Right, you know? right. We, right. Exactly. Live below your means. So, I mean, to learn from a guy who works with millionaires that it's not just for people who have necessarily a millionaire or a million dollar income, like people, everyday average income people can take proactive measures right now to build wealth. Like he doesn't like you just said, he doesn't like to focus on the, the cutting back, but he, he says that within each one of us is the means and the opportunity to raise our income, whether that be through additional work or business endeavors. It's I mean, just, we got to get in that mindset. What ways can we make money, make money look with at, our look skills? Look at the example he, he gave us of the school teacher. Yeah. You know, she is a, what, a millionaire? Yeah. She made a million dollars off her lesson Teaching, plans yeah, exactly. and selling, selling it online. You know, we all have gifts and abilities and skills that are marketable. And I loved also how he said, if you could find 100 people to give you just 20 bucks yeah. every single week. Don't just focus on the you, big overall right. number, you know, break that thing down to see what type of moves you can be making on a weekly basis, on a daily basis to attain the income level that you desire. Man, I thought that was cool. It was I, mean, awesome. I, I took notes from it. So I hope you did too, guys. We hope that you learned some lessons on building wealth and know that it's not just for the people you see on TV. It's not. It's something right. that you and I can be working towards today, right now, as we speak. What are you going to do? Are you going to take proactive measures to build wealth? Or are you just going to say, oh, that's just for other people? Today's the day that you can take charge of your life. And we can help you with that. Just go over and visit our website, hisandhermoney.com. We have a ton of information over there to show you how to manage your money better. Here it is. No matter where you are on the road to financial freedom, the key is to start now. And finish strong.